I'm Indy Nidell, and I'm sitting here in a hotel in Przemysl, Poland, because we're rebuilding our studio in Berlin, so we're shooting on the road, and this is another outstanding episode of Out of the Trenches, where I sit here in the chair of temporary insanity in front of the horses of wisdom and answer all, and the flow of knowledge, ooh, and answer all of your questions about the First World War. Merc, F. Mercury at, from Patreon writes, uh, is this the real life or is this just fantasy? Well, you're caught in a landslide. There's no escape from reality. So open your eyes and look up to the skies and see. Um, I'm, I'm just a poor boy. I need no sympathy because I'm easy come, easy go, a little high, a little low. Any way the wind blows doesn't really matter to me, right? To me. Patrick Bartell from Patreon writes, uh, Hello, Indian team. First of all, thank you so much for an incredible channel. Thank you. Uh, I'm currently reading Poilu, the journal of Louis Bartas. By the way, Corporal Bartas tells it, uh, it seems that soldiers' own officers tricked them into going over the top with promises that, in quotes, it'll be easy. Hoping you, you can shed some light on this topic of officers tricking their own men into marching to their deaths. Well, who is still willing to go over the top after hearing they'll probably get killed? Okay, Frederick the Great tried to motivate his soldiers by yelling, you cursed rascals, do you want to live forever? And it didn't work out so well. Every frontal attack in military history has had a high chance of getting the soldiers killed. And since ancient times, leaders would ride down the ranks to encourage their troops by telling them that it will be easy. Don't worry about it. The Great War was a bit different, though, um, in the fact that it wasn't just one big battle. And every soldier pretty much knew after the first few months or even weeks that it would not be easy. And like all the attacks before, it would cost a lot of lives. Maybe this time, their own. And sometimes in war, troops have to be intentionally sacrificed to allow other soldiers to win. But of course, no officer is going to tell those troops that and would instead promise them that this time the artillery bombardment is successful and that no defender was still standing and the barbed wire was cleared and the poison gas cleared everything else out. And if it was a lie, then it was most often a lie they wanted to believe. The soldiers in the trenches didn't have a choice either way. Milo Martin from Patreon writes, uh, Howdy, Andy. Howdy, Milo. Um, for Out of the Trenches. With Poilu and good soldier Shrake in mind, compare and contrast frontline soldiers and common soldier relationships in the various armies. Thanks, First Sergeant Milo, U.S. Army, God Save Texas. Don't mess with Texas. Which is an anti-littering campaign about not littering on the public Texas highways, and it means nothing to do with don't fight with Texas. I grew up in Texas, I know. Um, Frontline, lower rank NCOs, maybe uh, especially even soldiers that rose through the ranks, up through the ranks during the war, often bonded with their fellow soldiers on a level of deep camaraderie since they usually endured the same hardships, they ate the same crappy food, and they saw the same amount of combat as the soldiers of the lowest ranks. And when you think uh, respect that's earned always outweighs respect that is ordered, with regard to the higher officers and their staff, there was often a fundamental cultural difference in attitude, and there was a big gap between the commanding officers and the actual frontline soldiers. And it often showed in behavior, attitude, even language. Um, the soldier Schweik is the prime example of this on how the problems uh, during the war derived from that gap. The military authority of the Austrians fails to gain the respect and the loyalty of the Czech soldiers because it fails to connect with them on a cultural and more importantly, respectful level. Um, Colonel von Zillergut uh, arrogantly patronizes his soldiers and General von Finkenstein is like the aristocrat who has no respect for the common low-ranking soldiers and their reality. One of the lessons 
from those novels, from both of those novels, is that there is a big difference between those who only command and those who actually lead. Uh, Choi William writes, Hi Indy and team, I really love the show and I always thank you and your team for an awesome, for awesome work. Well, you're welcome. Uh, how was the treatment for criminals? Were criminals in prison conscripted to penal military units and sent to the front line for suicidal missions and meat shields, just like Soviet Union did during World War II. This really is an interesting question that you don't read very much about. Now, there weren't any regular or official penal military units like those from the Second World War that were primarily made up of convicted criminals with the task of clearing mines or, or undertaking suicidal attacks. There was none of that. Uh, the central powers were forced to send men who were petty criminals in their civilian lives to the front lines where they would be under the supervision of both the officers and the other enlisted men. Um, since military regulations were pretty tough, that usually worked out pretty well. But by looking into the records of courts martial of the British Army, you find that some offenses inside the army were punished by penal servitude. Since all of the harsher crimes like, like plundering, destruction of military equipment, rape, uh, stuff like that, they were punishable by death. Crimes like disobedience and drunkenness were met with, with lighter disciplinary measures. It's also interesting that penal service was more serious than imprisonment or being cashier. So the penal service had to be for something really nasty. Um, the Russian army introduced flogging in 1915 to deal with criminal offenders, mostly to punish the breakdown of discipline. But it's hard to say, it's hard to know at all, how often it was actually carried out. Um, for most of the countries, we know how many death sentences were carried out and how many soldiers were imprisoned for crimes, but for some nations like, like Russia or the Ottoman Empire, the records are just not available. Now, we are shooting this in Przemysl, and if you'd like to see more videos from in and around Przemysl, you can click right here to see our good friend Ryan's channel, Cult America, when he spent some time in Przemysl making such videos. Do not forget to like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, and never forget to subscribe. See you next time.